Good morning. It's great to be with you again, worshipping, even though I don't see you in front of me, I know you're there. Um, it's got to be cool, hasn't it? You're probably all sitting there in your, uh, your winter pyjamas now in your dressing gowns. And, uh, never mind. We've, um, we don't have much in the way of announcements, I don't think. We've, uh, we've uh, got virtual men's coffee again on Tuesday at 10 a.m. If anybody wants to join us blokes, uh, we'll have um, the on, online live prayer meeting again next Sunday at 8.30 uh, a.m. And then, of course, we'll have church again next Sunday. Hope you're all keeping well, keeping uh, safe, keeping well isolated. Let me read from Hebrews, the, um, the uh, yes, Hebrews, this is chapter 4, verse 14 to 16. Therefore, since we have a great high priest who has ascended into heaven, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold firmly to the faith we profess. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to empathise with our weaknesses, but we have one who has been tempted in every way, just as we are, yet he did not sin. Let us then approach God's throne of grace with confidence, so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. It's a great thing to know, isn't it? We can always approach the throne of grace, no matter what's going on. Let's sing this beautiful hymn, song, before the throne of God above. to question number eight in the New City Catechism and um, this morning's question is what is the law of God stated 
in the Ten Commandments. So as we look at the Ten Commandments, what is the law of God in those Ten Commandments? And we know them quite well. We've been through the Ten Commandments. So let's think about it together. And, and just by the way, you can also download it. If you go into um, one of the app stores, you can download New City Catechism. You can have it on your phone, just like I have. And then you can use it that way too. And um, just read every Sunday as we, as we go through it. So what is the law of God stated in the Ten Commandments? You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make yourself an idol in the form of anything in heaven above or on earth beneath or in the waters below. You shall not bow down to them or worship them. You shall not misuse the name of the Lord your God. Remember the Sabbath and keep it holy. Honor your father and your mother. You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not give false testimony. You shall not covet. So as we look at Scripture, what does Scripture say? If we go to Exodus uh, chapter 20 and verse 3, it says, You shall have no other gods before me. That is a prerequisite as a believer that uh, God is the only God and besides Him there is no other. With that in mind, let's, let's pray together. Let's pray. Most Holy God, You showed Your love to Your people by giving them Your commands. May we always give thanks for Your law. You have not left us, in, uh, us ignorant of how to walk in the way of the righteous. Help us to glorify You by opening Your Ten Commandments. Yes, Lord, you've given us these commands and I pray that we would read them, we would digest them, we would become obedient to them, but also to the way that Christ has fulfilled the commandments in the New Testament. So, Lord, this day, would you help us as we endeavor to obey your commands, your precepts, your laws. For Jesus' sake we pray. Amen. going to sing again um, just before Pastor Bruce comes back to lead us in communion. Um, this is uh, a beautiful, relatively modern song called Calvary.
this morning we share together in the Lord's table. It's a very special time as we know we've just come through Easter, we've just seen uh, the sacrifice of Jesus on the cross for our sin and not only the sacrifice but then him rising from the dead and um, with that action he has conquered death, he has conquered Satan, he has conquered sin. But he encourages us to do it as a remembrance um, to him. Remembrance of, of all that he's done for us and, and a place that I love to go, especially when we are doing communion, is Isaiah chapter 53, the suffering servant. We come to a greater understanding of who Christ is and, and the suffering that he had on, on Calvary, that he, he suffered for our um, sins. I'll start the reading from um, Isaiah chapter 53 from verse 3. He was despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And as one from whom med, men hide their faces, he was despised and we esteemed him not. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace. And with his wounds we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. I want you to get the, the, the full picture there is... Of, of Christ on the cross and understanding the the weight of the world is on his shoulders the weight of all sin of all humanity of all time is on the shoulders of Christ Jesus and he has to bear it if he couldn't bear it he couldn't be a savior if he couldn't bear it he couldn't be the Messiah that scripture talks about this is this is Isaiah this is way before Christ would suffer on the cross and yet the prophecy was there from Isaiah to speak about Jesus on the cross for a moment just think about the the body that was torn to shreds think of the the cat of nine tails the the uh, whip that they used that would pull open the the very flesh of of, of Christ not only that think about the blood that would drip and 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 would be spilled just spoiled all over the ground and, and, and it seemed like such a great waste that such a beautiful whole person would be so decimated by the, the Romans and, and, and the Jews and then be nailed to a tree on, on a hill. People back then must have thought, well, uh, he must have deserved death, but he was found to be innocent. Even Pilate said so. He said that there's, there's, there's nothing that I can convict this man of. And he wanted to have him flogged and then just released. But the Jews wanted death. They wanted murder. They wanted Jesus on a cross. So this morning as we, as we share in this uh, meal together, as we think about the, the, the body of Jesus and the blood of Jesus, let's think of our own sin. Our own sin that is laid on the back of Jesus. That is laid in every wound. It says in Scripture that by His stripes we are healed. No, not, not, not our sicknesses, our, in, in, our, our, our um, uh, coughs and colds. And, no, that's not the healing that it's talking about. It's talking about salvation. It's talking about our souls to be healed from the curse of sin and death. Jesus takes sin and death and crucifies Him. And then He rises. So as we uh, celebrate this together, let's, let's come to the Lord in prayer. Let's pray. Father, as we spend this time thinking about our sin, as we spend this time thinking about the sin that was laid upon your shoulders, I pray, Lord, that, that we would come to um, a, an incredible knowledge of, of, of the sacrifice that you, that you made in our stead, that you took our place. Oh Lord, well that thought must never grow old with us. That thought must never be a thought of, 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 of just a passing. I pray that we would dwell on that thought of, of the Son of God sacrificed for humanity. 
Lord, I want to pray now for each person that is, is watching that, that in these next few moments of silence that we would come to you and that we would confess our sin. Let's do that right now. Lord, we come to you with our, our sin, with our pride, with our arrogance, with our self-sufficiency, with our stubbornness. And we ask that you would forgive us. Lord, you know the sin that, that trips us up. We place that before your cross. Would you forgive us of our sin? For Christ's sake we pray. Amen. As we think of the body of Christ and we think of how it was torn to pieces, how it was bruised, how it was really butchered, we think of our own lives, how we've given our lives to sin instead of giving it to Christ, how we've denied Him, how over and over and over we've gone our own way. But this very moment, let's take the bread and think of Christ and know that we are forgiven. Let's eat. We also think of the blood of Jesus that he shed for each one of us. What can wash away our sins? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. We are so thankful that today we can celebrate this because Jesus is alive. He's not dead. But that sacrifice will stand as a testament to our sin and to his righteousness. Let's drink together. Father, as we have partaken of this divine meal of the body of Jesus and the blood of Jesus, may we always be reminded of his great sacrifice. But also, but also may we be reminded of the freedom that we experience in Jesus Christ. Lord, we love you and we ask that you be close to us. Help us to be obedient to your word. Help us to confess our sin moment by moment as your Holy Spirit brings remembrance to our minds. Through Christ's name we pray. Amen. Thank you, brother. We're actually going to continue to pray now. Um, my, my privilege to lead us in, a, in another time of prayer and... Uh, yeah, I'll, I'll pray, but um, I'm sure you have many things that uh, you yourselves would like to pray, and, and feel free to do that too. So let's pray. Heavenly Father, uh, as, as, as Pastor Bruce has just been saying, we are so grateful to you. Thank you for, for your grace and mercy to us. We thank you for the sacrifice of our dear Jesus and... Uh, words really fail us when, uh, certainly fail me when I try to, to describe the depth of that, that thankfulness and gratefulness. We thank you that you've, you love us, that you, you know each one of us by name and you know all the trials and problems that we're going through and that uh, you, you want to draw close to us and you want to help us and lift us up. So, Father, I, I pray that for each one of us, 
in the uh, various issues and problems that we are dealing with and uh, the isolation. Father, I pray that we would call out to you, that we would allow your Holy Spirit to minister to us, that we would feel your love and your, your warmth and your comfort surrounding us. Father, you are such a mighty God and such a loving God. I thank you for, for the leaders of our country. I, I thank you for the way they've been guiding us through the last weeks and months of this COVID-19 pandemic. I thank you for the way things have been improving. I thank you for the promise that, uh, that the rules and regulations will be relaxed and uh, even as I speak, they've already been relaxed. And Father, I, I pray that we would continue to be wise and careful in the way we behave. It's not simply enough to have good leaders. Father, we need to be help us to do the right thing as well. Help us to honour the decisions that have been made. Father, I pray for all our brothers and sisters at seat and place also. Thankfully, as far as we know, the there is no major sickness or problem there. And Father, we pray that that would continue. And we pray that you would bless the staff uh, that work there, particularly Jay and Palmer, that who we know quite well. And Father, I pray that that place would be a real oasis of peace and calm and joy and blessing. I pray for all our brothers in, in Bangladesh. It's, uh, it's a hugely difficult time over there. Um, as you well know, Father, I pray that you would protect uh, our staff and our beneficiaries and, and, and in fact everybody in Bangladesh, particularly those who can't work and who have no money and no resources to back them up. Father, I pray that you would provide for them. And I pray for the leaders of symbiosis over there that they would work wisely and help to, um, to do good and to care for everybody that's in our our uh, sphere of influence over there. And I, Father, more than anything, I, I pray that at this time, when, um, when everything seems to have been turned upside down, when, when people's ideas and thoughts have been challenged in many ways, Father, I pray that many would, would turn to you for, for inspiration, for guidance, Father, maybe even people who've never even thought of you before mm. would be prompted to to think of you and to, um, and to find out more about you and to, to learn of the truth of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And Father, I ask that also for, 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 for people in Bangladesh and all those, those through the Muslim world as they, as they step out into Ramadan when, uh, when it is a, a, a fairly spiritual time for them anyway. Father, I pray that many people over there would have their eyes open to the truth of your gospel. The, the, the majesty and the power of the gospel of Jesus Christ, mm. the risen Saviour, the one who is alive. Father, we thank you that you are alive and with us right now. Father, we just praise you. We love you. In Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to sing. I'm going to sing one more song and then um, Leslie will come. Uh, read the, the scripture for us and then Pastor Bruce um, will come and bring the message for us. It's, it's a great song, particularly at this time, he's always been faithful, has he not? Morning by morning I wake up to find I can't 
because of my name, for they do not know the one who sent me. If I had not come and spoken to them, they would not be guilty of sin. Now, however, they have no excuse for their sin. He who hates me hates my father as well. If I had not done among them what no one else did, they would not be guilty of sin. But now they have seen these miracles and yet they have hated both me and my father. But this is to fulfill what was written, what is written in the law. They hated me without reason. When the counsellor comes, whom I will send to you from the father, the spirit of truth who goes out from the father, he will testify about me and you also must testify, for you have been with me from the beginning. Oops. Thank you, Leslie. Well, keep your Bibles open to uh, John chapter 15. When we look at this passage, we kind of can't believe what Jesus is saying. He's, 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 he's talking about hate. And we've come uh, to see over the last little while um, from when the disciples were with Jesus up in the upper room and they decided to leave to go to the uh, Garden of Gethsemane. He starts to speak to them about things that would happen and reasons why they would um, be persecuted by the world. And Jesus talks a lot about love. He, he talks about how they should love one another, love people, um, and know that they're in Christ, and, and, and true love can only be found in Christ, true joy can only be found in Christ. And, and, and this seems to be a, a theme that goes on until we hit verse 18. Until we hit this verse 18, um, that kind of sounds weird. It's, it's, it's almost like there's another gear that, that Christ has gone to. 
and um, he wants to now step away from the love that he's been talking about and, and concentrate on something a bit different. Concentrate on, on things that will be really testing for people's faith. Not only back then, but today as well. Um, as we followed uh, Jesus and his disciples, um, and, you know, showing that there is this bond of love between them and, and even in death, um, that bond of love cannot be broken. Um, we, we see a new, a new kind of teaching from Jesus, a new uh, focus. Um, he wanted to prepare the disciples for what was to come. Um, so they're on the road to Calvary. In fact, in a few hours, um, he would be separated from the disciples and he would ha do the greatest sacrifice that would ever be done and fulfill what has been said by the prophets. If you look at John 15 verse 17, it says, These things I command you so that, um, so that you will love one another. Jesus has set up the great divide in humanity. He's talking about love, but then he talks about those who do not love him. And it's almost like a watershed moment that there are going to be people on a precipice and they will either fall to the one side or they'll fall to the other side. The one side is, is the love of God, is, is loving Him, is ab abiding in Him, is obeying His commands. And the other side is going their own way. You see that Jesus set up this great divide in humanity. Um, on the one side you'll have those who love Jesus, who obey Him, who abide in Him. And on the other side you have those who hate Him, who disobey Him, who don't want to abide in him. These words of Jesus would challenge and shake the authority of, of, of any religious entity in the world. It would, it would take them and, 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 and make them sit up and take notice that there's an ultimatum here. That you cannot have it both ways. You cannot uh, both worship something else and worship God at the same time. Jesus unapologetically says, you are either with me you either obey me, you either love me, or you have no part in me. Those are tough words. This is a tough statement. If you think of your own life, you think of, 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 of the person you love most. Um, it could be your son, your daughter, your wife, your husband, your parents, um, the people that you, you, you love so much. And, and if somebody comes to you with an ultimatum and says, well, either you love those people, or you love me, it's, it's, it's really tough. And that's, that's in fact what Jesus was saying, is that all love that has been given by God encompasses itself within Christ Himself. So within Christ is His true, perfect, holy love, and everything else is, has been tainted by sin. We as humans want to sit on the fence. We want to see uh, the merits of both sides. We want to see how this pans out. But with Jesus... There is no fence. You are either with Him or against Him. You either love Him or you hate Him. Christians are the most persecuted people in the world because of this fact. That they love Jesus. That they follow Jesus. That they abide in Christ. We all know it's a, it's a, a fact of life that Islam is the foremost persecutor of believers in the world. And it's, it's the radical Islam. It's the, the radical ones that, that say, kill the infidel, kill the Christian. A hundred million, million people uh, are under persecution in 41 Muslim countries right now. And that number increases all the time. But it's not just Muslim countries as well. We think of China. We think of the, per the persecution that happens there under that re regime. That you've got uh, churches that are government churches, but they are told what to say and how to say it. You've got many churches that have gone underground, and we are so thankful to people like Hudson Taylor, who, um, with the China, Land, uh, China Inland Ministry, uh, set up churches, and people got saved, and, and that is going even till today. We think of Russia, of many, many years, uh, decades ago, where people went to Russia and spread the good news of Christ, and how uh, the Soviet people have um, put everybody under subjection to the Russian law. We think of India 
and the many people who are persecuted there because they not, are not part of, of, of the Hindu or even uh, any other culture that, that, that is there. The Christians are very different and, and they seem to be different and they are persecuted. People are murdered on a daily basis. We think of Nigeria, we think of places in Africa where people are persecuted. We think of South Sudan where they would bomb churches regularly and, and, and persecute and kill Christians. So we, we get the picture that, that there's mass persecution around the world. But have you ever thought why? Why are people so uh, avert, uh, averse to, to Christians? Why, why do they hate us so much? Why do they hate people who, who love Jesus? Why do they hate a religion that, that helps the poor, that feeds the hungry? that houses orphans, saves babies, starts schools, uh, builds hospitals, goes into really tough situations and, and helps people regardless of their life because they know that their life is in Christ. So if they lose their life, it doesn't really matter. They hate Christians because what they, Christians, believe is true. And because it's true, it is like a conscience to them about what is right what is wholesome and what is just in this world. This world is, 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 is so unjust, is so unrighteous, is so wanting to go down its own way that it turns its back on everybody else. You see, the Bible tells the truth about the power of Satan and his kingdom. That's the, the, the bottom line. You see, there's a divide between the economy of Satan and the economy of God. And we have got a decision to make about those two economies. Satan is at war with God and his followers. Christ is the focal point of that anger. He knew that if he could uh, get Christ to deny the Father when he tempted, tempted Jesus in the desert for 40 days, then he has won. That, that the Son of God is now nullified. We are called Christians, little Christ. He, uh, his representatives here on earth. Don't be surprised by his anger against you. It's not because uh, of your good looks. I know some of you got dashing good looks or wonderful talents and you can do all kinds of things. No, it's not because of that. That's not why he's angry. It's because you have the Holy Spirit living within you. You are the temple of God and you house the divine in your body. Satan hates God and his Messiah, Christ Jesus. And if he hates them, he will hate you. Understand that you represent, you're an ambassador for Christ on this earth. So Satan hates you. And he hates us. And that's never going to stop. And understand that the persecution, even though we are so free in Australia, is going to ramp up. We are going to see it. It's going to hit us soon. But how did this come about? How did this come about that a, a, an angel, and an angel of, of incredible light, they called him the morning star, this beautiful angel in, in, in pristine glory came to uh, go against God himself. You see, Satan had pride in his heart and wanted to be as God is. Isaiah 14, 14 says, um, what Satan said, he says, I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will make myself like the Most High. In Ezekiel, we read that too, that, that Satan said, I will, I will um, uh, ascend. I will go to the holy hill of God and I will, I will, I will. It was all about him. That's what he wanted. Satan always wanted to be God. God threw him out of heaven and he's been trying to get back at God ever since. Satan eyes us like pawns in the chess game against God and against each other. Realize that, that he will use the very things that we hold dear to want to get back at God and get back at our fellow believers. So going back to the text today, uh, I want you to see three main reasons why Satan hates believers. Yes, Satan hates believers. Well, look at, let's look at verse 19. Reason number one, we are not of this world. 
I don't know if it's been told to you of this before, that, uh, that we are aliens. No, not those aliens that you see in spaceships or anything like that. But we don't belong in this world. We are not from this world. Even though we're born into this world, we are partakers of a second birth. We are all born into the world of sin. Psalm 51 verse 5 says, Behold, I was brought forth in iniquity, and in sin my mother conceived me. Understand that every baby born into this world is under the power of Satan, under the power of sin, until God reaches down and changes their hearts. There is nothing we can do about it. You have no say about your birth, but you do have say about your second birth or rebirth. God reaches down from heaven in the Holy Spirit and awakens us to the realization that we are in sin and that we need a Savior. You don't wake up one morning and say, I need God. I know there's so many people that would say that. Well, I found God. No, God found you in your mess. God found me in my mess. And then He woke me up as to the fallenness of my nature and that I would never be able to go to heaven if it were not for Him. Romans 3.23, we all know it. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Understand that your sin is what keeps you away from Jesus Christ. Your sin is what keeps you away from the Holy of Holy, who is God Himself. You cannot be in God's presence and, and, and have sin inside your heart. But you see, Christ comes and gives us rebirth from above. Not from this earth. We, we don't belong to this earth. Once you've been reborn, once you are a believer, Christ's Holy Spirit comes into your heart and you are changed forever. We are made new, a new creation, no longer condemned by God, um, but through life and death and the resurrection of Jesus Christ, we are born again. So we are not of this world. We belong to God's economy now, not to Satan's anymore. And he is not happy with that. Just like a kid, you know, a kid when you, 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 you discipline them and they don't want to do what you've asked and you take their favorite toy away, what do they do? They throw a hissy fit. And that's Satan. He's throwing a hissy fit and he doesn't want you to be anywhere near, near God. And so he's going to do whatever he does to be spiteful to keep you away. The world as we know it is anti-God. It is ordered after Satan himself. People are unregenerate. That means there's nothing beautiful or new that's growing in their hearts. All they want is their own prideful lives. They are still in sin. Still under the curse of sin. They love their lies. They love their deception. They love themselves. There's, there's two things that, that, that cause bankruptcy within their hearts. The first thing is morality and the second thing is spirituality. Understand that their morals are all over the place. They haven't got the compass of God's word to understand where true north is and they will go all over the place. Secondly, spiritually, they are dead. When Adam and Eve sinned in the garden, God said, you will die. The first death is a, a physical death where this, this body dies. But the second death is even worse. It's the spiritual death. And we've all died a spiritual death in Adam. But in Christ, we are able to be reborn again into newness of life that only Jesus can give. 1 John 3 verses 11 to 13 talks about Cain when he killed his brother Abel. It says Cain's deeds were evil. This world is evil after Cain. Cain was not happy that, that God uh, took uh, Abel's um, a sacrifice over his and, and, and there was a problem. So he killed his brother. Verse 13 is, is really important. Do not be surprised, brothers, that the world hates you. Understand that, believer. The world hates you. The world wants to go against your every move because your every move must be that of Christ. So it's going to hate you. We as believers are a, a conscience to Satan's world. We remind them of who God is and, and, and what we're supposed to do. The world loves evil. It loves doing evil deeds in the dark. It loves murder. It loves fornication. It loves all kinds of lewd acts that are committed in the dark. But, but Christ came to bring light 
to the dark. He came to shine light on our dark deeds, to show that it is wrong and so that we can change. Please, please understand that Satan's economy, including religion, that is not from God himself and, and from his word. So religion is included in that. Anything that, that, that points you away from who God is, that points you away from scripture, that points you away from God's economy is satanic. The world hates our message, the gospel of Christ and salvation. It hates that, that, that you've got sin. Don't tell me that I've, gone, I've got sin. Don't tell me that I'm a sinner. Don't tell me that what I'm doing is wrong. So that's number one. Why does the world hate us? Because we're not of this world. We're aliens. Number two. Why does the world hate us? Verse 18. Because they hated Christ first. They hated Christ first. He says, if, if, if they hated me this much, imagine what they're going to do, for, do to you. Remember when Jesus had all these people, thousands upon thousands, with him. And they were following him. And they were feeding. And they were doing all kinds of things. And he turns to them one day. And he says to them, um, if you want to truly follow me, pick up your cross. Come after me. Deny everything else. Deny yourself. And they looked at this and they said, no ways. We, we're out of here. Understand that if you love Christ, obey Him, follow Him, read His Word and follow it, you will be hated by this world. Christ came not to get rid of the law, but to fulfill it. He brought a higher standard to live by. If we think of, of, of murder, murder is bad. Murder is really, really bad. And, and in the Ten Commands, uh, com Commandments, it talks about that. But just think of anger. Just think of when you are angry with somebody. Jesus says that's like murder. It's just like you've murdered your brother or your sister. Think of lust. Adultery is, is bad. G going and being involved in adultery, you, you're sinning not only against God, not only against the person, but against your own very body, your, your body. But he says if you look at somebody in lust, you've committed adultery. It is now about the heart of humanity, not the actions must be transformed by Jesus not just what people see on the outside but our very intentions our everything that's inside must be changed because of this the world will hate you think of the 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 acts according to the apostles the book of acts Stephen stands up in front of all these so-called religious leaders and condemns them for what they did to Christ they take him and they, 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 they block their ears and they cannot uh, listen to him anymore. And they throw him down and they get rocks and they stone him. Think of the disciples who love Jesus. And, and after Pentecost, after Peter stands up and, and gives a wonderful testimony and, and, and he's somehow transformed and a different person. Just think of how he now is, 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 is this man who is the rock. Of, of, uh, that Christ talked about how, how he was now not even worried if he lived or died. The disciples were martyred for their faith. Some were beheaded. Some were stoned. Some were crucified. Some were crucified upside down. They were thrown into the lions to be eaten. They were burnt alive. Murdered on mass by impaling them and then setting them alight. Understand this. Love for Christ equals hatred of the world. Hatred of the world equals persecution by the world. So if you hate the world, the world is going to persecute you. Get used to it. Because it's coming our way soon. So, uh, first two reasons. Why do they hate us? Number one is because um, we are not of this world. Two, because we... Um, we, we, uh, they hated Christ. And now number three, the world doesn't know God. They hate us because the world doesn't know God. Verse 21, they do not know um, the one who sent me. You hear people saying all the time, well, I believe in God. I'm a spiritual person. I know of God. What they are saying is that they know that there is a God. 
But I'm happy for him to stay in the Bible. I'm happy to, to, to leave him alone and maybe he will leave him alone, leave me alone until such time as I need him. Until such time as, 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 as I'm in need, then I'll call on him and, and then he must do his magic and then he must get back in the Bible. Back where he needs to belong. When they say that they are spiritual, it means that they are open to anything of a spiritual nature. Whether it's so-called angels, or crystals, or icons, or crosses, or pictures of saints, even the Bible itself. Some, some people will venerate the Bible, that that's, that's everything, the physical book. They, they, they don't like what's inside, but the Bible, it's an important holy book. What does all of this have in common? They are in control. They do not want God to be in control. God, you stay in your box. And I'll take you out when I need you. It's almost like that genie in Aladdin. Let's rub the, the, the lamp and, and, and let the genie come out. And then when we're done with our wishes, then you can go back inside. That's, that's fine. But that's not the God. And that's not how He functions. God is all-powerful. All-knowing. Ever-present. He is the creator of the universe. He made you and He knows you better than you know yourself. The very intricate uh, DNA that it makes up your whole body, He put that together. To know God is to know what His Word says about Himself. To know God is, is to submit to His will for my life. To know Him is to die to self and to live for Jesus. Now, you might say, okay, Bruce, what does that mean? I don't quite get it. Well, if you want to die to yourself, your every need, your every want, needs to be in tune with God, what God wants. So first of all, your salvation. If you are not saved, if you don't know Jesus Christ personally, if you haven't got a, a living, loving relationship with Him, then there is a problem, number one. Number two, when you do have that living and loving relationship with Him, you will hang on every word. You'll be obedient to His commands. Everything that He commands you, you will do. That's knowing God. That's a love relationship. That's dying to self and knowing that what God wants is more important to me. Verse 23 says, Whatever hate, uh, Whoever hates me, Jesus, hates my Father also. We in our natural state hate God. We want autonomy. We want to run things ourselves. We want our own way. We don't want to be told to do anything. Let me take you to a passage in Scripture that describes the world right now. Let's go to uh, John chapter 8 and verses 39 to 47. This is such an important passage because yet yeah, Jesus is talking to the uh, Pharisees of the day. He's talking to the religious leaders and, and he, he points the finger and notice the intentionality of Jesus to, to, to bring them to the understanding of who they belong to. Let's read together. So uh, it's John chapter 8. And verse, from verse 39, they answer him, Abraham is our father. And Jesus said to them, if, if you were Abraham's children, you would be doing the works Abraham did. But, you, but now you seek to kill me. A man who, who has told you the truth that, uh, that I heard from God. This is not what Abraham did. You are doing the works of your father. Uh, you are not doing the works your father did. They said to him, we are not born of sexual immorality. We have one father, even God. Jesus said to them, if God were your father, you would love me. For I came from, uh, I came from God and I am here. I came not of my own accord, but he sent me. Why do you not understand what I say? It is because you can bear, um, you, it's because you cannot bear to hear my word. You are of your father, the devil. And your will is to do, uh, is to do your father, what your father desires. He was a murderer from the beginning and does not stand in the truth because there is no truth in him. When he lies, he speaks out of his character, for he is a liar and the father of lies. But because I tell you the truth, you do not believe me. Which one of you convicts me of sin? I, if I tell you the truth, why do you not believe me? Whoever is not of God, he is, whoever is of God, hears the words of God. 
The reason why you do not hear uh, them is that you are not of God. So understand here that Satan is the father of lies, that these people were, were, were more in, in tune with who Satan was than uh, who Jesus is. And they were just being uh, so dogmatic about the, what they believe and they wanted to believe what they wanted to believe. Notice the last words in, in um, where am I? Uh, in, in verse 47 it says, the reason why you do not hear them is that you are not of God. Understand that, that people who don't belong to God are not of God. They can't be of God. So why do they hate us? Firstly, they hate us because we are not of this world. Secondly, they hate us because the world hates Christ. And thirdly, they hate us because they don't know God. Romans 1 from verse 18 onwards has a mirror effect of what the world is today. Please turn there. Romans chapter 1 and from verse 18. This is God's wrath on unrighteousness. The wrath of God has been revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men. For by their unrighteous, uh, unrighteousness, uh, who by their unrighteousness suppress the truth, for what can be known about God is plain to them, because God has shown it to them. For His invisible attributes, namely His eternal power, divine nature, have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world. In the things that have been made, so that they are without excuse. For although they knew God, they did not honor God, uh, uh, Him as God, or give thanks to Him, but they became futile in their thinking. And their foolish hearts were darkened. Claiming to be wise, they became fools and exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images resembling mortal man and birds and animals and creeping things. So the world hates us because they don't know God. They don't know Him. They don't love Him. They don't walk according to His precepts or His law. So as you, you, you sit down today and you, you think about these things, remember those three R's we were talking about. Firstly, the record. As we come to God's Word, we see why uh, the world and Satan hate us. It's because of those three things that I, I, I mentioned. Secondly, we look at uh, the relevance. What, what relevance do, is that to me today? Well, the relevance is that if I want to be a follower of Jesus, the world is going to hate me. But that's okay because I am with the, the creator of the world. I, I don't have to worry about anything else. He is with me and that's a majority. And then lastly, what's my response? My response is that I want to tell people about the Savior who can save them as well. Who can love them, who can heal them. My response is that I want to tell people about this God that, that, that not only um, took upon himself the, the, the salvation of humanity, but then reaches out in love and gives us his Holy Spirit. My response is to love him and obey him and to follow him. Let's, let's pray together. Father, as we think about this wonderful passage you've given us, and we think about the hatred of the world. We know beyond a shadow of a doubt that you love us and that you've given your son for us. Lord, help us to take in just how much you love us. For your name's sake we pray. Amen. Thank you, brother. I yeah, appreciate that so much. Oh, it's so good to be worshipping with brothers and sisters who, who do love God and who love you. Let's finish with a song that um, we haven't sung for a while, I don't think. Um, in fact, I, I don't think it gets sung in church a lot, really, which is a shame. And I, the theology certainly seems to be fine to me. Maybe it's just because it um, seems like a bit too much fun. Certainly a song I love singing, and uh, I know my, my, uh, my young mate Jono, Jono Lambert, I know you love, it, love singing it too, mate. And I miss seeing you, miss, uh, miss seeing you in church, and uh, can't wait till the, the time where we can meet again, and 
We'll see you again face to face. I love you, mate. Take care. Let's sing A Shelter in the Time of Storm. Salvation comes from him. He alone is my rock and my salvation. He is my fortress. I will never be shaken. Well, thanks for worshipping with us this morning. Um, we, uh, we hope and pray that you have a, have a good week, a, a safe week, a peaceful week. Uh, keep well. And I look forward to seeing you again next week. God bless. <laughs>